Welcome to our guest for the Commission on Safety and Agility. This is the first of five evidence sessions that we're going to be having. Um, and today we're focusing on conflict and security. Just to remind everybody, the aim of the Commission on Safety and Agility is, is uh, simple but uh, grand. We're trying to uh, write the future rule book for aid and development and assistance in the light of the fact that half of the world's poor soon will be living in fragile states. And so we think trying to address the causes of fragility and trying to help fragile states is the absolutely key thing for aid and development policy for the future. So we're starting from a very academic standpoint of looking at what works, looking at the evidence, and then trying, listening to practitioners such as yourselves, to draw out the policy lessons from um, the evidence in, in principle and the evidence in practice. So it's a bold effort. We may have bitten off more than we can chew, but we're determined to have a really good crack at it. I'm very grateful for you putting in your written submissions and for giving up your time today. There are two evidence sessions really this afternoon. The first is the harder end, military intervention, peacekeeping, and security sector reform, how do we help build security <coughs> in these countries? And then this afternoon, uh, the later session, looking at how you prevent <coughs> conflict in the first place, how you resolve conflicts that are underway, uh, and peace building efforts. But actually, the excellent witnesses we've got kind of cover both areas. And so my colleagues, please feel free to question any of the witnesses on any of the subjects. The way we're going to do it is, is start with um, Jean-Marie uh, Guerrero, President and CEO of International Crisis Group, and uh, Andrew Mackay, retired Major General, with great experience in uh, Afghanistan and in Iraq. And what we're going to do is ask um, each of you to give an opening statement, make some opening remarks. That will be filmed so it can go up on the website. Then the cameras uh, will switch off for the <coughs> question and answer session. I think. Paul and Tim, my co-chairs, um, I think we want to keep the questions and answers very much a conversation. It's very, you know, what you would feel. <coughs> that nothing is off limits. We want to really get, get to understand your understanding of what works and what doesn't. So this will be not like a sort of House of Commons select committee where my colleagues were quite well known for just simply showing off in front of the cameras. It's a genuine attempt to find <laughs> answers to the questions, and so we're going to do it in that spirit. Anything my co-chairs want to add before we crack on? Brilliant. Okay, <coughs> you're already happy with the, the grand rules? Um, well, let's start with you, Jean-Marie. Well, thank you very much for, for inviting me, and I think this, uh, this commission comes at just the right moment, because I, we have had a <coughs> 15 years the first 15 years of this uh, century were years of confidence in the idea of <coughs> intervention, whether it was on the conservative side of politics, on the liberal side of, of politics. Uh, and uh, after 15 years, I think in, in public opinion and even among practitioners, there is a sense of uh, overdose. Uh, do we know what we are doing? Uh, it's expensive. Uh, so the combination of questions on how much we know and of budgetary constraints means that there's enormous pressure uh, for uh, sort of giving up. And I think what, uh, what, I would, what I would see as the most important goal for that commission is really to find the right balance, to calibrate between maybe excessive ambitions that characterize the, 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 first, the, the, the past years and at the same time a sense of giving up uh, that, in my view, would be very, very dangerous. Uh, I'll just make a few simple points. One is that security is the first public good <coughs> that people demand in, uh, in a post-conflict uh, situation. Everything flows from that. Uh, we see today in Mali that one of the problems in Mali is that the state has not deployed a number of rural areas. And so, there, because there is no security, and uh, civil servants are not too keen to risk their lives <coughs> in places where they're not protected. And so, if you want to build schools, if you want to provide the basic public, public services, if you don't have security, uh, you won't have the other services. Uh, security is the first public good also because it's necessary for political reconciliation. If you are not sure you're going to sleep at night, uh, you're not going to... Uh, to offer your hand to the, uh, to the other side. So that's, that's the starting point. Second point is that security is highly political. 
And there I want to make a couple of points. I, I live in, uh, in New York City most of the time. And in New York City, the police force in New York City is 35,000 uh, people. There are 35,000 officers in a city of roughly 8 million uh, people. The police operates at the margin because most uh, inhabitants of New York uh, accept the established uh, order. And so the police is there to, uh, to intimidate or to prosecute, to arrest those who don't respect it. In a post-conflict situation, uh, the essence of it is that there is not yet agreement on an established order. Uh, and so the level of uh, force that would be required to impose order by force is, is quite uh, considerable. Uh, I, I see it also, I mean, I, I speak next to uh, the general, so I have to be careful, but I, I remember reading the, uh, the US Manual on Counterinsurgency. Uh, and I think it's relevant for our discussion in the, in the sense that it says that the force has to be, sized, to be sized in relation to the people to be protected rather than the opponents to be defeated. Uh, and so, in a way, the, the ratio then of uh, force to population matters. And if my memory is correct, that ratio is about 20 uh, soldiers per 1,000 uh, uh, people uh, to protect. Uh, in the United Nations uh, context, you're nowhere, nowhere near uh, that ratio. And I'm not advocating that we should get near, because that's, uh, I'm not a utopian. Uh, let's say in Congo, where there are about, I'm not talking about the whole population of Congo, but let's say in the eastern part of Congo, 10 million people, uh, you do the math, <laughs> you're not going to deploy 200,000 uh, troops, uh, foreign troops in eastern Congo. So it's just not in the cards. Um, and so if you don't address the political <coughs> side of things, the notion that through force, through deployment of uh, uh, any kind of force, um, a, a much more robust force of, uh, than the UN, like in, in Iraq or, or in Afghanistan, a NATO, NATO force, a US-led force, uh, whatever you, you deploy, uh, you're not going to have the ratios that allow for uh, bringing peace uh, through intimidation. Uh, the third point, is that the evolution of conflict further complicates today the use of force. Um, the, the most uh, obvious evolution is what we know of uh, now non-reconcilable agendas, uh, to, I mean, to characterize terrorist organization with transnational agendas. And that raises very difficult operational questions. Can a peacekeeping <coughs> force coexist uh, with a counterinsurgency or counterterrorist uh, force? It raises all sorts of practical questions of chain of command. It also raises political questions because the political strategy is often geared at peeling off uh, people who may have joined the terrorist groups but who might be separated uh, from, from them. Uh, if at the same time you're shooting at them, uh, mm -hmm. you, 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 have, you have a problem. The other, uh, the other reason is that we see more and more that the line between uh, politics and crime is blurred, and that there are more and more political uh, criminal agendas that pollute uh, conflicts. Uh, you see it, well, I, I, in Mali you have smugglers uh, on both sides uh, of, the, uh, of the fight uh, who have an interest in smuggling people, uh, weapons, uh, drugs. Uh, in Latin America, uh, you have levels of violence in a country like Salvador. I was struck to learn the other day <coughs> that the number of victims of violence in Salvador is second only to Syria. Uh, nobody would think uh, that's, that's possible. So, but in, in those cases, it's not about a political agenda. It's a situation where, in a way, peace is, uh, war is not good for business because it really is really too disruptive, but full peace is not good for business. And so there are now stakeholders who have a real interest <coughs> in keeping things in that gray area. There is a sustainability of conflict. Conflict is a goal. It's not something you want to get out of for a number of, of actors. Fourth point, international uh, security agendas are often <coughs> manipulated by local agendas. I can give several examples. I remember discussing with the, uh, actually, the head of AfricaCon uh, at a time when the U.S. Uh, wanted to uh, train a battalion in the RC to fight the LRA. And I, I was, I was uh, saying that, uh, that uh, 
this might be a good idea, but this was also reinforcing Kabila in a strong sense because there was no, no interest in, uh, in Congo, particularly for the LRA, and so if you have an elite force, it will have maybe other uses than just uh, the, the LRA. Second example, I remember negotiating with <coughs> Debbie, uh, president of Chad, uh, when deploying a Chadian uh, protection force in refugee camps. Uh, all the people of that protection force were coming from the uh, ethnic group of Debi, uh, the Zagawa. It was a way uh, also, uh, but paid by the international community, a way to, to strengthen a group that would support his own agenda. Or today we see uh, the Kurds uh, being uh, allies, uh, YPG, allies in the fight against ISIS. The Kurds don't give, um, ISIS is certainly not a top priority uh, for, 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 for the PKK or, for, or the YPG, uh, but uh, so it's, a, it's an alliance of convenience which can then create problems <coughs> down the road. Um, so the agendas of the local partners may not s fit the agenda of the international actors. Um, uh, next, uh, fourth point, non-political <coughs> goals are often a diversion. Uh, we have seen the disaster in South Sudan. Uh, it was striking to see after, how after the independence of South Sudan, uh, <coughs> there was a notion that one had to build now the superstructures of a state, but the, the foundations, uh, political foundations had not been laid. Uh, and so what, what happened is uh, the whole superstructure crumbled because the, all the political tensions within South Sudan had not been uh, attended to. So it was the wrong, the wrong priority. Uh, and it again makes the, point, makes the point on the politics in security. Uh, another area where non-political goals are often a diversion, uh, protection of civilians. Of course, everybody wants civilians to be, to be protected, uh, but it's a tactical goal. Uh, if you make it the strategic uh, goal, uh, you are putting yourself in a situation that will have no end. Uh, and, and also the ratios are such that you will offer uh, insufficient uh, pr pr protection. So, last point, what to do <laughs> after <laughs> this rather grim <laughs> uh, description? <coughs> well, I think we have to recognize that even after 15 uh, years of um, hard experience, uh, we know something, <coughs> but we don't know that much on what works and what doesn't uh, work, because there are examples and counterexamples, and so a certain call for humility, I think, is, is warranted. We have to recognize that we are operating, that as external actors, we are politically and operationally weak. Politically, because we will never know the country the way the uh, people uh, who are in the country know it, obviously, uh, and also we don't have the same stakes, uh, so we'll get tired uh, before the actors in the country get uh, tired and operationally weak. I, uh, I referred to uh, the NYPD, and uh, so we will never have the kind of force that it really is capable of, uh, of crushing in the way, uh, let's say, Germany <laughs> or Japan were crushed uh, after World War II. And it's, in a way, it's a progress of w uh, warfare uh, that uh, now it's much more uh, discriminate uh, you, you, you use of force. But it means that when you get into a country, uh, the complexities are still very much uh, there. There's not <coughs> this sort of huge shock of total defeat uh, that characterized the end of World War II. So what can we do? I think we have to compensate our weaknesses with strong situational awareness. Uh, so the more intelligence, the more intelligence in the, in the technical sense of intelligence and also just in the broader sense of understanding what's happening, uh, understanding the politics and putting a lot of resources there, I think is, is essential. I think in terms of force, the more mobile, the more nimble uh, we are, the better, because that can compensate up to a point the fact that there will never be enough uh, force, but you can sort of preempt if you know that something is cooking somewhere and you, you can anticipate a, a bit. I think it means that in terms of security sector reform, it should never be considered as a technical exercise. Uh, you have to see who is going to be uh, trained, 
what's going to be the chain of command, who will have real authority uh, on the forces uh, you train, how it's going <coughs> to change the balance of power between the local actors. And in the end, all that can be summarized in one point, is that politics should drive the strategy, but at the same time, force can be an important component of leverage. And if you don't have it, uh, then you may be in a much weaker uh, position. I'll stop there. Thank you. Excellent. Really helpful. Um, Andrew, if you'd like to go next. Try, try to keep the interruption to 10 minutes, but um, that, that's a really helpful start. OK, thank you. Um, well, th first of all, thank you very much for inviting me along to to express some thoughts and, um, and considerations perhaps more focused on how to get this area, which is critical, as you, as you mentioned earlier, David, to write in the future, given um, it's, uh, you know, I, I think the statistic I heard was 50% of the, the world's poor will live in uh, fragile countries um, in the future. I, I rather, in my opening remarks, what I've tried to do is um, take a, a framework which uh, we developed uh, as a consequence of uh, my time in Afghanistan and Helmand. We then took some of that framework into this book, uh, Behavioral Conflict, and I'm, this is not a plug for the book, um, I'm sure, uh, please, please assure you it's not. And um, I'm trying to imagine a, a framework for how we might tackle some of this uh, in the future. What we've done is tended to look at this as um, what I'd call a conflict ecosystem. So if I take, say, Helmand or Iraq or even Kosovo, Bosnia, anywhere where we've been involved in some kind of intervention and where you distinguish Bosnia and Kosovo, um, there were very few body bags of British soldiers coming back. The ones that did were probably being killed in a road traffic accident. And so that you have a very different um, ecosystem because of that. If you look at Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and the casualties uh, and the number of soldiers who've been killed from throughout the coalition forces, um, you have a very different ecosystem as a consequence of just the sheer violence and the scale of it that's going on. So we looked at these ecosystems in the sense that you know, when you're on the ground in Helmand and you're a soldier leaving an operating base with 100 pounds on your back, and there's every chance that you'll be contacted or there'll be an IED that you'll have to deal with or someone who is seriously injured you'll have to deal with. The sort of policy that emanates from the capital cities is at best very distant at that point. And the idea of the, the ecosystems idea is how can you connect what is policy more coherently with individuals who are leaving an operating base and who may not return to that operating base? How can you connect the meetings that many of us will have had with the governor <coughs> of Helmand within this ecosystem? <coughs> and the point about understanding it more fully is that um, they're all actors. We have to remember that we're a key actor within that ecosystem. And with the rise of networks, which I'll come on to, the actions of one will have an impact on the rest of us. What we do impacts on everyone else. So trying to think through some of those second and third order consequences of existing in that kind of ecosystem is, is, is incredibly difficult. The work we do in Africa now, we imagine these as project ecosystems because, frankly, they're subject to the same kind of pressures where you haven't got all of the information, you don't know, you've got limited intelligence, um, and you know that uh, within that ecosystem there are individuals who will support you and those who won't, but you don't necessarily know who is on which side of that particular fence. You can probably guess that most are sitting on the fence uh, and it's for you to, to try and win them over. Uh, but not necessarily to gain their support, but to gain their consent, which is uh, uh, probably about as much as it can do, go in terms of um, a conflict-ridden uh, ecosystem. I think there's sort of four elements to this then. First, I, I would so is understanding. Time and time again, I was struck, be it Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan, even Northern Ireland, where we simply didn't understand enough. And it, what really struck the, the, the piercing insight for me was a constant consequence of reading a lot of behavioral economics before I deployed, <coughs> where we were interpreting the behavior 
of communities as entirely irrational. Why wouldn't they accept democracy? Why wasn't it a good idea for children uh, and, and women to be educated? And it was only the realization that actually um, we were the ones who were being irrational. And so that sort of piercing insight that they were actually entirely rational because of the environment, the circumstances, and everything else that led us to make any number of very <coughs> poor decisions as a consequence of not failing to understand fully the environment. In an environment, the signal and the noise, and it's incredibly difficult at times to discern the strong signals of what consent might look like. And more often than not, we misinterpret it because of our own lack of understanding uh, on, in terms of looking at this very complex environment. I think the second element of this is organization, and, and I mean that in the very broadest sense. Um, I think these environments, fragile states, are very um, demanding, and if you make your mistakes early, they tend to stay with you um, for a long time, and they're very difficult to undo if you get your policy, your operations, your tactics wrong uh, at the beginning. And that's an organization in the wider sense in terms of uh, in Iraq, we had to uh, rebuild uh, a police force. We had to rebuild everything, frankly. And errors that were made at the beginning stayed with us for um, a very long time. So organization is also, the, you know, our own organizations, they're the ones that allow us to adapt. You know, I'm, I'm always mindful of Alvin Toffler's words about the illiterate of the future will not be those who cannot read or write, it will be those who can't learn, unlearn, and relearn. And the military in these environments do have particular difficulty in adapting, but so too back in capital cities, they have difficulty in adapting to an unfolding situation on the ground, which can be at best very confusing or, or, or absolutely incoherent. So organization is important, and out of that, Jean-Marie mentions SSR, a subject that I've been very intimately involved with, SSR, I've always viewed it as basically our exit strategy because the point at which a state can provide its own security and it's actually managed and controlled by the state is the point at which we can actually exit um, with a degree of confidence that what we've brought uh, is going to succeed. I think the third element is one what I'd call networks. Um, this is something which has fundamentally changed enormously in the time that I've been conducting uh, operations in these countries. And um, I think it's, um, I can't remember who said this now, but the, the nature of an object, being a, a, an organization, a person, a village, changes when it connects. And what we're seeing now is the rapid <coughs> utilization of uh, networks. Um, many of them are secure, and many of them are hidden from us. So networks are going to be a real challenge for us uh, in the future, and they're both a strength and, uh, and they're both something which, we're, which are going to cause us uh, enormous problems unless we actually harness them. I think it's interesting that um, there's nine platforms with a billion users on them, and f all four of them, uh, and they're owned by four US companies. So these networks have changed everything, and I think within an ecosystem, understanding how those networks are being run, how they're being managed, uh, uh, is going to be huge importance, and it's not going to be easy to, to understand them either. And then the fourth aspect which I would cover is the role of influence. Um, this was a major feature of my tour of Afghanistan. I hold no, uh, I make no bones about it, because um, I do believe that part of what we've got to try and do in these extreme environments, in these complex environments, is change behaviors. And you're going to do it through influence predominantly, and the more people you kill, uh, the less likely you are to persuade. And so part of that persuasion is what we as organizations, within our networks and within our greater understanding, have to do if we are to um, genuinely influence situations which are chaotic and often <coughs> it looks far worse than it is and it just takes a, a good night's sleep to realize it's not as bad as it is and you all soldier on. But influence, I think, is going to predominate and that will require a far greater level of cooperation between the various agencies that exist in these um,
complex environments in these fragile states uh, than we <coughs> imagine. And finally, just to close, I think as I look ahead to what is coming our way, we genuinely need purpose. Why are we there? And we genuinely need to understand that because that then allows you to form a narrative around why you're there. It allows you to explain to a very wide range of organizations, individuals, security forces, why you're there. And if that purpose chops and changes all the time, it causes enormous confusion and frankly <coughs> inhibits progress and development. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. I come from New York, so uh, the buzzword again in New York is conflict prevention. Um, um, just yesterday there was a debate about conflict prevention and human rights. Uh, this is under the U.S. presidency. Um, the, um, so we talk a lot about prevention, but prevention as an idea is not new. Um, uh, in fact, uh, in the UN context, the term prevent preventive diplomacy was first uh, coined by da Doug Hammarskjöld in 1960. So 1992, Boutros Ghali with the Agenda for Peace also talked about this issue. Kofi Annan presented three reports talking about uh, conflict prevention. Under Ban Ki-moon, again, more reports. Um, so um, everybody recognized you know, that um, prevention is, is essential. Um, and, um, but despite this consensus on the importance of conflict prevention, um, um, and also in the context of more recently in the last three years, uh, three um, uh, UN reviews of uh, the peace and security architecture, um, all these reviews um, concluded that the international community is actually failing at conflict prevention. So what are you know, the key um, uh, obstacles? Um, so the Security Council stress always you know, in its discourse the, um, the importance of, pre <coughs> of prevention, but um, in practice it failed consistently to take preventive uh, action uh, on many serious um, uh, situations when early warnings was available. So the issue is not lack of information, lack of early warning, the problem is lack of action, lack of political will. Um, so um, the, channel, the challenge is not, therefore, to provide accurate, timely uh, information to the Security Council. Um, the issue is how to translate that warning into concrete political actions. Um, this is what has proved to be very difficult um, in the Security Council, and something like this requires al also unity and leadership in the Security Council, and this is quite often lacking. Um, and I believe that without political will, both at the national level and international and regional levels, uh, very little can be uh, accomplished. Um, and the problem for us has been how we can cultivate that political will and sustain it over, o over time. Um, and, um, um, uh, keeping in mind also demands to pursue unilateral options also. So divisions at the regional and international levels undermine concerted uh, uh, action. Um, another obstacle is quite frankly the, um, uh, the absence of member state consent. Uh, and consent is a core principle of, of UN engagement. You know, I remember something like 15 years ago, under Kofi Annan, we formed a team called we created a, you know, a name for it, that thinking that wouldn't attract attention. We called it the framework team, but it was like a prevention team where representatives of the various UN departments and agencies come together and very quietly we start to see which countries have enough ingredients that may um, evolve into open conflict and what we can do collectively um, as a UN system um, with all its components, you know, the political, the peacekeeping, the humanitarian, the development arms of the UN, uh, and so on. And I still remember whenever we had a meeting, and, and in the UN nothing is confidential, you know, we had ambassadors coming to us, and you know, how on earth you dare to discuss my situation, um, even if it's an internal, small, low-key uh, meeting. So lack of consent, you know, from countries also has been um, a, a problem. Um, 
Prevention is relevant throughout the full cycle of UN engagements and it, it really pertains to the full spectrum and of tools of the organization's disposal. However, these tools and different phases of engagement fall under the purview of different departments, agencies, funds, programs of the UN system and a coherent and comprehensive preventive strategies are therefore difficult to devise and implement. So we have not only in the UN, but throughout the international community, uh, bureaucratic silos and organization fragmentation that is another challenge also to um, effective prevention because in prevention <coughs> usually you will need a combination of actions that um, can be in the security, in the political, diplomatic, but also development field. So it's this defining that combination and sequences that, that is also important. Um, in prevention, we attach very much uh, a lot of importance to the working with the regional organizations. But um, so it's very politically correct, you know, in the UN, um, for us to always stress how we support, you know, regional organizations and so on. And we have numerous examples, you know, here with the Security Council when um, we knew that there are situations in the making, evolving that will require international action, but the council failed to, you know, to, to, to act. Uh, I was the UN envoy to Yemen for four years. Um, it was public knowledge and clear, you know, to the Security Council that um, um, what we thought as a beautiful transition, the only, <coughs> the only negotiated transition in the context of the Arab Spring, um, that was the result of an agreement between opposition, the old regime and the opposition, a roadmap that was moving forward in terms of implementation, everybody knew that it's fragile and, uh, and uh, everybody knew that uh, there were many spoilers at work, um, spoilers who come from the whole spectrum, not only from one side or another, from many sides. And um, um, briefing after briefing, I briefed the Security Council, I think, on Yemen more than 30 times in the context of four years. I was briefing almost every month. Um, and every month, you know, I was only always repeating the same things, that this transition can progress, can move forward, but um, unless some action is taken against spoilers, it's, it may collapse. Uh, and you see where we are now, you know, in terms of, of Yemen. You know, I, I attribute part of the responsibility also to an international community that didn't take timely, um, uh, timely action. Let me move now and talk a little bit about um, peace building. Again, this is, there is a new debate in New York and in the context of the Security Council about peace building. Um, but what is notably absent from this debate is the, um, 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 a serious reflection and consensus on the objectives of peace building in post-conflict countries um, and how specifically to achieve these objectives. Many would say that these objectives are very too broad and too ambitious and so on, but it's time to have conversation about that. So um, peace building is conceptualized in two ways usually. Um, first, peace building is taken to mean a set of generally accepted activities <coughs> um, that we carry out like DDR and um, um, security sector reform, transitional justice, reconciliation, human rights and so on, but also economic revitalization. Um, so it's a laundry list of um, different forms of assistance provided to these post-conflict countries. And um, uh, this laundry list is produced against, uh, the, against which the international community measures whether peace building is taking place or not. Um, but there is a second um, uh, way of looking at it. Um, peace building may refer to the end objective of peace building. Um, um, uh, meaning as lasting peace and laying the foundations for achieving sustainable peace. The conditions for lasting peace have yet to be specified, but these are usually centered around um, one, supporting national constitutive processes that are directly linked to the implementation of uh, peace agreement, um, building consensus on a new system of values, um, uh, norms and institutions that regulate the peaceful uh, management of conflict, and um, three, building the legitimacy of the state through improved capacity to deliver on human security, to deliver on welfare, to deliver on human rights and the rule of law. 
The first and second meanings are not equivalent, and uh, while it is often assumed, um, it is not necessarily true that the activities under the first definition necessarily produce the lasting peace suggested by the second. So, um, uh, as a result of these two different concepts of peace building, uh, three things happen that are generating conceptual and operational um, uh, confusion. Um, first, post-conflict post recovery, reconstruction, reintegration, reconciliation are used interchangeably, interchangeably with peace building. And often these terms connote distinctly different phenomena. Um, second, peace building is referred to as a process leading towards normal development and simultaneously is understood to be a development process or a process with development dimensions. And the emphasis on activities put the focus on the actors who undertake them, um, meaning the international actors, um, and obscures the role of um, um, uh, the different countries concerned. So peace building is a form of international assistance. Is it a form of international assistance or is it a process involving international actors and resources. If it is a process, it is an international process where local actors are invited in partnership or um, a national process that the international community are expected to support. Um, <coughs> it has been assumed that our peace building efforts have been unsuccessful because of shortage of resources, inadequate capacities, and lack of coordination. Um, Peace building, this is the reason that are often stated. I'm not sure about that, I'm questioning this. Peace building often has been approached as a purely technical exercise involving transfer of resources and expertise and, and, and know-how. And hence the preoccupation on, of strengthening peace building capacities within our organizations, like uh, standing civilian capacities, rapidly deployable capacities, the obsession with this. It comes from that fact that we think that you know, is a transfer of know-how. That's all what this peace building is about. But this has led to the conclusion that addressing these problems um, will precipitate the successful establishment of peace in countries recovering from war. These assumptions, in fact, are, um, are <coughs> flawed because building sustainable peace cannot be done by outsiders. I mean, this is a simple thing that I have to state. Um, Integral to peace building is the degree to which national actors um, develop the political will um, uh, to take charge of their own destiny and make the hard compromises among themselves and to move forward. <coughs> um, so for me, the bottom line is that peace building effort must be, must be led by the leaders and citizens of the countries themselves, of these countries emerging from, from conflict, uh, it is national actors who best understand and must live with the history and dynamics and consequences of conflict in their country. We have to show some, hum some humility because we think sometimes we know it all, we don't. Um, in most of the countries where I served, I served in Afghanistan, in, in Iraq, uh, Yemen for years, um, we think that we knew the history and the dynamics and so on. We, and then we discover that we know very little. I think this is, um, I think we must humble ourselves and, 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 and um, um, stress that um, we need to make an effort to understand better, you know, these situations, you know, that's very um, uh, important. Thank you. Well, I'd like to bring you to, uh, just to, for, the, for the time, to bring your opening over then, uh, there, if you come on to the rest of it in, in, in our session, and just get James to do a brief introduction, and then, then we'll, we'll break for some coffee. That, that's it's a good, good point. It's, it's James. Thanks. I, I won't use those slides. We'll just, I'll just get to the point. Um, I run the Halo Trust. It's the world's largest uh, humanitarian organisation dealing with the debris of war. What we do is relatively straightforward. We stop people being killed and wounded, either because they don't stand on a landmine or an IED, or because the munitions that we destroy can't be um, farmed for use by terrorists elsewhere. We give people jobs. We employ 7,000 people around the world. They're people who might otherwise be destitute uh, or in conflict or migrating. There's about 30,000 dependents who rely on their livelihoods. That, of course, is short-term work for as long as the demining happens. The longer-term impact is that we clear land, which is then available for economic use, largely farming, but uh, light industry, uh, housing, etc. 
So that's a longer term impact. But perhaps the most important thing that we do is we restore confidence in countries. I was really interested by Annette's comments about Colombia. Um, President Santos of Colombia has declared that he wants his country mine free by 2021. Why does he want it? Why would you go to Colombia if you're going to stand on a landmine? You're not going to go on holiday there. You're not going to invest in that country. So he wants his country normalized. That's the strategic prize which our work does. So we are essentially an organization created for post-conflict work. But what we've talked about today really is a cycle of conflict. Pre-conflict, perhaps a conflict will never happen, in conflict and post-conflict. We have found ourselves in recent years being drawn from post-conflict countries into in-conflict. And that's a problem for us because unlike many humanitarian organisations where the, the, the aid that is delivered is clearly desirable for anyone because it is about food relief, it's about medicine, it's something that even Daesh might welcome. For our work, we're dealing with lethal munitions and we will be vulnerable. We have had people killed in ambushes both in Somalia and in Afghanistan. So, in a sense, the place that we can achieve the best effect is in countries like Angola, Sri Lanka, uh, Cambodia, countries that are in danger of being forgotten, but where we can actually spend money wisely and well and ensure the further stabilisation of those countries. We're being asked to go into countries like Libya, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, <coughs> all the obvious uh, culprits where our work is less easily done. We are, in a sense, clearing up after a roof leak. We're coming in to uh, mop up the water. But what's the point in mopping up the water if the roof is blown away and needs rebuilding? It's about that security um, architecture that goes around our work that is missing. And I worry that too much of the thinking about um, dealing with these countries is tactical, it's not placed within an overall um, plan, and therefore organisations like the Halo Trust try to get going in countries like Syria without any sense of overall British or other coalition plan. And I'd like to be much more integrated into that. I feel instinctively as a former soldier that unless that happens, our work will be pointless. Um, but that if it is done properly, we can achieve the right effect. So I crave to be better integrated into the thinking, which I think is currently lacking in most Western capitals. And there is a great deal of what I would call um, attempts to do stuff for the sake of doing it, uh, gesture strategy rather than a genuine understanding of the strategy that needs to be put in place. So my final observation would be, have we really thought through the mechanisms by which strategy is created? I define strategy as the, as the alignment of ends, ways and means. Politicians state the ends, the military and civilian officials come forward with suggestions about ways <coughs> and means. If those uh, ways and means are too expensive, coming back to almost to the very first point from Jean-Marie, then don't go there at all. It would be better for HALO, uh, let's say, if we wanted to open in Iran to work in a pre-conflict or a never-going-to-be-conflict situation. And we can work in post-conflict. Where I struggle is with those in-conflict countries. So that's really my message to you um, today. Thanks. I'll leave you it gave that. us a brilliant point from earlier questions about the role of potential role. I just want to ask, before we break, just ask Jamal one question, which is the best example of an early warning sign that was ignored. You talked about it. You talked about Yemen, which is a very complicated case. But have you got any other examples of conflicts that could have been prevented, where there were very early warning signs, but lack of political will or coordination that we are not allowed to deal with? Would you <coughs> say anything? We have a very clear case, Rwanda. Um, you know, there was a very substantive, clear report of the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation in Rwanda. Um, he predicted, basically, um, that the situation could end up with genocide. The information was there and it was ignored. So it's not the, only the faxes that Delaire sent you know, to the Secretariat. I mean, there were substantive reports also. I mean, just um, a couple of weeks ago, we presented a report about the situation in in Burundi to the Security Council. Burundi also, there is a cycle there, in the genocide in 62, 68, 72, 93, and the conditions are ripe there, you know, for something very nasty to happen. Um, so the information, there is no lack of information, but lack of, of, of action, concerted action.